Welcome to HCTV. I'm your host Steve Steiner with a special broadcast today looking at emergency procedures for Henderson County Schools staff and students. We have a full broadcast today so let's get right to it and ask Tony Fanock to lead off and share about emergency situations and responses. Take it away Tony. If there were to be a bomb threat through a phone call, remain calm and attempt to keep the caller on the phone as long as possible and record the caller ID. Listen to details in the background, such as whether they are outside, inside, or if they're in a populated area or not. Pay attention to specific qualities, such as gender. Have another staff member listen on another line if possible. Ask various questions, such as where the bomb may be, what does it look like, or when it may explode, and have the individual repeat in order to stall. Afterwards, notify the main office and authorities immediately, and do not broadcast for others to overhear. If there is any indication of immediate danger, evacuate immediately. When the building goes on lockdown, it is meant to keep students and people, including visitors, in the school building away from the violent perpetrator while law enforcement engages the subject. Parents are always notified and should not come to the school site and kids are not released to their parents until after the lockdown. There will not be any outside access or people allowed to leave the building. A lockdown procedure is indicated by an announcement over the intercom that states that all students and people should report to the closest classroom immediately. While in a classroom, lock the door, stay away from the windows, and try to keep noise to a minimum. Keep students calm, close the blinds, turn out the lights, so the perpetrator may assume that no one is inside. Students are not permitted to use the school phone or cell phones during this period and are not permitted to leave the classroom. If the fire alarm were to go off, do not evacuate unless smoke or fire is sighted. If possible, an emergency phone call or email will be sent out explaining the situation. If an individual or guest were to be sighted with a weapon, contact the main office about where the individual was headed, a description of the individual, and what weapon the individual may have. If the perpetrators were to be sighted and were to confront you, approach with caution and never stare at the perpetrator. Keep the perpetrator's attention on you and not on the students. Try to note every detail about the individual without seeming suspicious. Be prepared to give a description of the intruder in the individual's last location. Always try to notify law enforcement or the main office without putting someone at risk. Always prepare in-depth descriptions of the intruder and where the intruder was headed. If you discover a fire, remain calm and always alert the rest of the building or school by pulling the fire alarm. Always have a designated area for your students to meet at. Stay with your students and have a roster so that you can conduct a row to ensure that there are no missing students and report to the incident commander. Before leaving a room, fill the door with your hand before opening it so you can conclude that there is no fire on the other side of the door and so that you may not have to choose an alternative way, such as going out a window. If smoke is present, remain low to get through the area to the designated assembly area. Never return to the room to get personal belongings and only return to the building when a signal has been given that the building is safe to return to. Always maintain a safe area of assembly so that your class can meet as well as keeping your roster with you so that you can take role. Always aid the special needs students, individuals, and always remain alert. Thanks, Tony. Uh, weather is always changing around this area. So let's check in with Connie Sites and Keegan O'Daniel with some severe weather conditions and evacuation procedures. Safety is our top priority here in Henderson County. We really want to focus on the safety of our students under all circumstances. In the situation of inclement weather, we have to utilize a lot of resources in determining how we should respond as a district. Sometimes we use the National Weather Service, sometimes we use information from surrounding counties, and sometimes we use the information provided by the Kentucky State Police and our local emergency management people. In the situation when an early dismissal or an entire closure does occur, please keep in touch with the local media, keep in touch with our school website, our school Twitter account, or please listen to 401 call. A severe external condition includes any type of weather as well as earthquakes or any other phenomenon. 
A weather watch will be issued by the National Weather Service when severe weather conditions are possible. An actual weather warning will be issued only if there has been a sighting of severe weather such as a severe thunderstorm or tornado. The dangers of each storm including lightning, strong high winds, and flying debris. Remain calm and seek shelter in rooms that do not have long roof spans such as a gymnasium and away from windows. Interior hallways and the lowest floor are the safest shelter areas. In either storm, all doors and windows should be closed as well as moving everyone, including visitors and activities indoors. Assist any special needs student. Always take roll to determine if anyone is missing. In an earthquake, remain calm and get under a desk, table, or supported doorway. Instruct students to get under desk and cover their heads. Stay away from glass windows and mirrors and be cautious of falling materials such as bookshelves, furniture, or any other heavy equipment that may slide around and may fall. After the earthquake, remain in position for a few minutes in case of aftershocks. After waiting, do not rush for stairways or any other exits because there is a great chance they are jammed. Seek safety where you are. Avoid electrical lines because they may have fallen as a result of the earthquake. They may be electrically charged, therefore dangerous. If you are outside, remain in the open and be cautious of utility lines. Assist with evacuation if necessary. Do not be surprised if the electricity goes out. Always try to keep students calm. As I previously mentioned, safety here in Henderson County is our top priority. In the event that we may have to evacuate a school for any circumstance, we do have alternative sites where we will be transporting those students. Please listen closely to our alternative sites. Henderson County High School will be moved to Zion Baptist Church. North Middle School will be moved to Holy Name. South Middle School will be moved to First Christian Church. Bengate will be moved to Chapel Hill Church. Cairo will be moved to Cairo Methodist Church. Central Academy will be moved to the Housing Authority. A.B. Chandler will be moved to Cordon Missionary Baptist Church. East Heights School will be moved to Audubon Baptist Church. Jefferson Elementary School will be moved to the Presbyterian Church. Niagara will be moved to Belfield Baptist. South Heights School will be moved to Highland Baptist. And Spotsville School will also be moved to Sound Baptist Church. Thanks, Connie and Keegan, for that information. Now, Danielle Crafton, a special reporter, is in the studio today with Doris DeWitt, Chris Pfeiffer, and Nathan Grace. We're going to have a live chat on medical emergencies and psychological issues. Please take it away, Danielle. Thank you for watching the Health Watch segment. I'm Danielle Crafton, and today I'm here with a few of our Henderson County staff members. So thank you for coming today. Glad to be here. We have Chris Pfeiffer. He is a science teacher, and today he'll be talking about the toxic health hazards. We have Doris DeWitt. She is a school nurse, and today she'll be talking about medical emergencies that are not non-life threatening. And also we have Nathan Grace. He is a guidance counselor, and he'll be talking about the psychological health and suicide of staff and students. So thank you for joining once again. And we'll actually start with you, Nathan. If you could actually give us uh, some of the signs if a student um, or even a staff member uh, might display if they're experiencing psychological problems, uh, developing tendencies towards school violence. But mostly if you could uh, talk about students at this point. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of times on the, on the front line are the teachers, and they, they recognize a lot of the signs that students will have. Um, lack of work, you know, a lot of times the shutdown in the classroom, uh, disengagement, uh, isolation, those are some things that they'll see in the classroom. Uh, low test scores, uh, poor hygiene, a lot of times students will not be put together as well as they have been in the past. So those are some items that teachers might notice. Um, you know, staff members, principals, administrators also, you know, they'll also notice that students may, may uh, be moving away from them. So a lot of times it's the isolation that we notice that uh, causes that. Sure, sure. So uh, as staff members or students, um, if they witness an event of observing some odd behavior, what should they do? 
Well, they should come and talk to a, an adult. You know, a lot of times they'll talk to the student, but um, they feel that it's not their place to get into it. But we want them to be involved. Uh, you know, they're afraid that their friend's going to be mad at them, or, or in some case, uh, angry. But uh, we want students to talk to an adult so that we can address that conversation with the with the student a lot of times it might not be as severe as they think it is but if it is we want to have a conversation with them and with their parents and and make sure they're getting the help they need we have a lot of outside agencies that we can uh, provide with them uh, resources uh, if, if it's nothing that we can't handle in the in the school building sure sure and also um, if you could just address something that's obviously very serious uh, suicide um, if you hear of a rumor or uh, you hear a student thinking possibly about this, um, what would you do or what attempts would the school take if they heard of a rumor of a student um, talking about suicide? That's a great question. Um, well, over the past several years, you know, state legislation has put in effect suicide prevention as something that we need to take very seriously. Uh, it was always the taboo. If you don't talk about it, it's not going to happen, but, and that's not the case. It's, it's there and it's not going away. Um, what we want to do is, again, make students aware that it is very serious. Um, we want students to talk to us about this. Uh, adults come to report that to us so we can report that to uh, the parents and, and have conversation again, um, providing them with counseling. Uh, getting them either a mental evaluation if they need it. Uh, we, you know, we as the counselors or the administration uh, try to stay with that child at all times when we hear that. If it's here at school and someone comes to us, we'll get the child and we'll stay with them until the parent comes and, and we have an emergency meeting of, of some sort, uh, do some paperwork to just to document on our half that we've followed through to uh, cover our bases because we want to make sure that the child is safe. Uh, and so, you know, it, a lot of times we get confused with the paperwork, but we want to make sure that we are covering ourselves so that we are taking the best steps for that child. Well, thank you for uh, touching base with students. And I know staff members may be a different story, but still, if staff members uh, are in harm, uh, to do the same, to sure. come and talk to another staff member? Yeah, with all the stress that we have today in society and, and with work, uh, we want to know that too. I mean, we're not here just to provide services for students. We're here to provide services for, uh, for staff as well. Um, you know, the counselors all have advanced degrees. A lot of us have our master's degrees in counseling. Uh, we have a few that are licensed uh, family practice counselors also. And we also have the resources to put them in touch with. Um, you know, if we don't have healthy teachers, we don't have healthy schools. And so we want to provide, you know, teachers with also the resources they need to be successful and, and healthy too. So Sure. Well, thank you for uh, heading uh, home with that. I know that that happens anywhere. And so I appreciate you talking about that. Thank you. Uh, and then Doris DeWitt, uh, she is going to talk about medical emergencies, as I said earlier. So uh, Doris, in the event that there is a, a medical emergency that is non-life threatening, uh, what steps occur in the, the sense that if a student were to come to you today? Okay. We have uh, several elementary schools, two junior highs, and of course the, uh, the high school. Um, not all the schools, there are a few of the elementary schools that do not have a nurse. But every school has a trained medical assistant. Uh, all the medical assistants are trained in first aid, CPR, medication administration, how to recognize emergencies and, and how to deal with those. For those schools that, that do have a nurse um, during the school day, uh, if a staff member has a student or a fellow staff member that has a uh, medical emergency that's not life-threatening, what you should do is, um, first of all, if you are the person in charge, it is so vitally important that you stay calm. You reassure that student who is ill or injured and the fellow students around that you have things under control and that you're going to be doing everything possible for that student's best interest. So keeping a calm environment, secure that environment, um, get fellow staff members to assist, and you really should isolate that student or that staff member by removing the uninvolved or the unaffected students uh, from that room. Get them to a different environment so that they can uh, stay calm and reassured as well. Uh, if you do have a school nurse, you should uh, contact that nurse immediately and administration. It's vitally important um, by contacting that school nurse uh, and the medical assistants too if there's no nurse in that school they are aware of 
pretty much every student in that school, even the 2,000 students that we have here at the high school, uh, the three of us in the medical office are aware of students who have uh, medical uh, conditions that may require emergency treatment or emergency medication. So call that nurse immediately. When you call, it's very, very important that you give crucial information. Number one, your location. Where are you? Where are you calling from? If you know the student's name and you're calling on the phone, you can give that student's name. We keep all students' emergency cards in our uh, nursing office. If we know that student's name, when they call me, I can tell my medical assistants, pull that student's emergency card. They will make a copy in the event that we do have to send them to the hospital by ambulance. We can send that vital information uh, with the paramedics to the hospital as well. So you contact the school nurse and you give your location, the student's name if you know it, and what the problem is. Is it a medical condition? Or do they seem to be having a seizure? Have they fallen? Have they hit their head? Are they unconscious? Give us some information if you can so we'll know what we need to bring with us to respond to that situation. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of after school activities when the nurse is not there, when the medical assistants are not there. And a rule of thumb that I've always tried to practice by that we were taught in nursing school, if you think it, you probably should do it. If you are there and there are no medically trained personnel there, if you think that situation uh, calls for a calling 911 and the ambulance, do it. Better be safe than sorry. We always like to err on the side of caution for that child or that staff member's protection. Now, um, if you are the primary caregiver for that student or staff member that's ill or injured, you need to keep in mind that you want to protect the injured or the ill person, but you need to protect yourself as well. Anytime there um, are body fluids, blood, emesis, that type thing, any fluid that comes from the body, anytime that is present, protect yourself. Um, we keep non-latex gloves here available to all staff members. Most of the teachers do keep a pair in their rooms and uh, I would advise all teachers to do so as well because you never know if and when you may need those. But be sure to protect yourself from that by wearing uh, the non-latex gloves. We should treat all body fluids from all persons as if they are infectious. In other words, um, some of our major um, viruses and bacteria are spread through body fluids and us coming in contact with it. Um, so wear those gloves to protect yourself. Uh, if there is a spill of body fluids that needs to be cleaned up, the custodians do need to be notified because they are trained in the proper way to clean those spills up and believe it or not we, we do have a protocol uh, that tells us exactly the way they should be cleaned up. So um, in summary just if you are the primary person there responsible for the ill or injured student or staff member keep the scene calm, remove the unaffected students uh, from the room, have another staff member take them out in a quiet area, reassure those students if you are calm those students are going to stay calm. If we panic, they're going to panic. Um, so it's very, it's vitally important that we keep the scene as calm as possible. Um, do not move that person unless their life is in danger or threatened. For instance, if the school's on fire, if someone falls is injured, um, and you're not medically trained and don't know if you should move them or not, if there is uh, uh, a danger to their life, a threat to their life yes move them then but if it's not life-threatening situation do not move them call for the nurse or the medical uh, trained medical personnel immediately have them come tell them where you are what the student's name is what the problem is uh, and any medical information that you may know about that student would be very important too because that will be passed along to the parent and um, uh, the hospital as well if they need to go to the hospital uh, protect yourself always wear uh, protective gloves if you're handling anybody's spills at all. Um.
And it's something that you said that kind of made me think back to what our conversation sure. was is about protecting yourself. And on the counseling side, with talking about suicide and psychological, we also want to protect ourselves and the confidentiality of students. So Absolutely. we want to make sure that even in medical situations along with counseling, that information that you get is confidential information. And we don't, as a teacher, if you learn that, don't share that information in, out with the other teachers. Uh, we will allow, you know, we will pass that information along as counselors and administrators to teachers that need to know that information. Mm -hmm. and, and, and humans are curious. We want to know what's going on in the buildings and we want to know what's going on with our colleagues. But uh, again, a lot of times it's a need to know basis. And, and if you get that, some, if someone says to you, I'm sorry, but you know, I just really can't fill you in right now, uh, you know, don't take that as a rude situation or, or you know, hatred. It's just we're trying to protect our students' confidentiality as well. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what she reminded me of when we talked about being safe with, you know, the gloves it's also that situation too sure so. you both have hit on valid points a lot of it comes down to it sounds like uh, trust and uh, the trust between the student and the staff or the staff and the staff so um, and obviously we're talking about sens sensitive subjects here uh, but both of those are obviously a medical emergencies and from psychological health uh, to uh, medical health and uh, now we go to the toxic hazard health uh, as Doris explained, there are spills that go on within the schools, and, but also there are spills that go on uh, within our science rooms um, as well as throughout other buildings. So Chris Pfeiffer is going to hit on a little bit about what would happen if there were to be a toxic, a toxic spill um, in the lab, for example, or within your classroom. What are some steps that you take? The first, the first step that I would take as a teacher is to make sure I stay calm as a as the leader of that room it's really important to stay calm and assure the students that we're going to do everything we can to get you in an environment that is safe so if it happens inside the classroom we want to definitely remove all students from that area um, remove the students from the safety area the hazardous area um, so taking them to another classroom would be what I would recommend doing um, closing the door behind you because there are fumes that come from those spills um, if it happens outside, which is another common place that happens in a science teacher's classroom, is outside a lot of times as well, uh, you want to definitely make sure you're upwind, um, upwind from that chemical spill because the, the fumes, again, could be very potentially deadly. Uh, and then close, make sure you take your students, assure that they are all with you, and take them indoors, close the doors, close the windows, close the vents. Um, and then immediately notify your school nurse and your school administration um, because that is really crucial that they have a part in it as well. Um, what so if a student was curious about a substance? What would you tell them? You definitely want to make them aware. So tell them all you know about them as a professional and as a teacher. You want to make sure students are very knowledgeable, um, know what you know about that substance. Because a lot of the students, I know where I come from or where, where I'm from, they want to know and they are curious. They want to open the things. They want to smell it. And that's the first thing as a teacher, you have to express the safety rules in your classroom and as a, as a district policy, you have to go through that and make them aware of what's going on as far as safety. Now, uh, could you emphasize about labeling uh, bottles and... Labeling bottles mm -hmm. is so important because students, if they see a bottle that's not labeled, that's the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go and explore what's that, what that, what is that. And a lot of clear substances can be very deadly, so um, the, even if they could sniff it, it could be potentially very, very harmful. Could you give us an example of um, something that you're working on currently in your classroom, maybe a project, and just so uh, that our staff members know and, and, and curious parents, uh, you know, what could possibly go wrong in a classroom when there's a staff member there? Sure. The first thing that I would do as far as in my classroom when I'm doing experiments in labs is making them aware of the eye wash areas, the fire blankets, and all of the safety equipment that's inside your classroom. Uh, making them aware of where it's at and how to use it is really important um, as a teacher. And um, some of the things that I'm doing in my classroom right now, we have currently been um, exploring hydrochloric acid and how it reacts in a chemical setting as far as we put zinc metal with the hydrochloric acid and there's a chemical reaction that takes place. And you can see the steaming, the fizzing, and there's some odors that are, that are actually accumulated from that. It's really important hydrochloric acid is a very strong, odorless, clear acid. And it's really important that you uh, emphasize the, uh, the touch of that acid could really be damaging to their skin, to their eyes. So uh, using, using the safety eyeglasses, using um, the sinks, the eye wash, 
all of those are really important tools as far as if the student were accidentally to make a mistake and to touch the acid, uh, what to do in those, those situations. So going through the, the procedures, going through these safety issues on a daily basis when you're in a laboratory setting is just crucial for a teacher. Um, you can't be too safe in a laboratory. Um, so those kinds of things, emphasizing those things and staying calm when things do happen because abs accidents will happen. And when accidents do happen, you have to be the leader of the classroom and you have to stay calm and you have to assure the students that it's okay, um, but we're going to follow the proper procedures and we're going to uh, call the, the school nurse and tell them what's going on and make sure they're involved in the, the safety cleanup and all of those kinds of things. Right there. And yeah. do you yeah. want well, to add to that? You know, and one thing you talked about in, in being a former science teacher is uh, we use a lot of gas, uh, you know, and so therefore you, you got to be the other teachers around have to be aware of that too because Absolutely. you know a student turns the valve on as you leave the classroom and, and, it, and you're the you're at the door and, and it takes a while for that to accumulate and sure. build up so other teachers around the, the labs need to be aware of what the odors are and, and what's going on and if there's anybody in the lab because you know that once that builds up and starts to come out of the door you know where you know where the shutoffs are so the other teachers around need to know where some of those things are not just the science teacher Definitely. because you know that's the you know the, if your class is down the hall then you want to make sure that too because we've had that situation before for. It's just, Definitely. you know, kids being curious and interested and, of course, you know, you want to be safe for all students. So. Sure. sure. Kids being kids, I would say. And if in that situation, um, in that classroom, if, if there is some type of hazardous spill or, you know, if, if it's hazardous and the students must be removed from the room and, and you notify the nurse or the medical personnel or any, even the administrators, if you know what the spill is, if you know what the hazards are, Tell those individuals that you've called to come assist. You don't want them going into it, uh, a, that environment unprotected without the appropriate uh, breathing apparatus and them becoming a victim as well. And we keep MDS sheets on all chemicals in yes. the district and even the cleaning supplies. Anything that's purchased by the district has an MDS sheet uh, that's on file with the science departments and, the, mm -hmm. and your custodians mm -hmm. and stuff. So if in doubt, you know, ask an administrator and they can lo locate what's in that bottle and, and everything should be properly labeled like you said. Mm -hmm. so. Well, this is great. Um, as you can see, we do have procedures in place um, from uh, psychological health uh, to toxic hazards. So is there anything else I'd like to finish? Would you like to add before we end our segment today? No. I'd like to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to express some of the concerns and, and the situations that we deal with to you know make more people aware of that. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for um, joining me today. And I know that this is obviously serious uh, topics, but and in all, any circumstance, uh, if you have a question, please uh, contact uh, person that's in charge of the facility and in any emergency uh, obviously dial 911 so that's the end of our health segment and we'll turn it back to you Steve thank you all for sharing your time and information with those aspects of safety moving on to our look who's talking segment uh, which deals with uh, talking to the media we have this to report if a school or building has an emergency that requires assistance from the central office, the following procedures should be followed. Notify the superintendent's office and a team will go to the site that needs assistance. A one call stating the level of response needed will be made for informational purposes to the appropriate groups. Public information officer will meet with the assistant superintendent at the site and serve as the communication link to the central office relaying information and updates on the situation directly to the superintendent's office. Other central office staff will stay in their respective building and help with the uh, phone calls. The public information officer is our media spokesperson and will relay pertinent information to the central office and will coordinate the media to one location. There are multiple Kenwood radios on our campus. Each person going to the school site will take a radio with him or her Channels are listed on the back of the radios and we will be using channel 9 as our emergency contact channel. Information will be relayed to the central office through radios or cell phones. It is then coordinated to go out as a media release and relayed to other schools as needed. No one should call or text any school or employees working in a school without a directive from the superintendent's office. Today we'll end our broadcast with an editorial by Dr. Ritchie, followed by a short video entitled Run, Hide, Fight, a clip dealing with surviving a shooting event in the workplace. Thank you for watching.
I'm extremely interested in the topic that's being discussed today with our educational family in the Henderson County Schools. Uh, one of the things that encourages me about uh, school safety is that it's everyone's business. We talk about principals and assistant principals, school administrators, the superintendent, his staff, and other administrators throughout the district. We all play a key role in making our schools the safest and the best places for children they can be. You know, we have a, a great responsibility in terms of making sure that the board has developed policies that govern safety and that we have developed administrative procedures to make sure those policies are covered, covered and carried out within the district. So we believe we have those pieces in place. We believe that the Henderson County Schools are very safe, but what is enough? We believe that we can always improve, and that's our endeavor is to make schools the safest place that we can make them day after day, week after week, year after year. I don't know of a school that does not want to prevent uh, violence in the schools or resolve unsafe conditions. But this is a good time to remind the staff, all of us who work within this district, that we all have a responsibility to be alert for some of the things that can take place in our school. We need to be following those procedures without question. We need to be making sure that the procedures are safeguarded because these policies and procedures are not put in place for any other reason to be able to guarantee parents that their children are very, very safe in this school district. And so we're fortunate to have those kind of policies and procedures and training and safety and those other activities that lend to this credibility. Creating a safe and environment that is important to the school as well as to the parents is a continuous job. Many times I hear people say, well, you know, that couldn't happen here. Well, violence is no respecter of place, and no respecter of position, and no respecter of schools. It can happen any place, at any time. And we have a, a record in our society today that shows that it can happen in the East, the West, the North, the South, private schools, public schools, charter schools, anyway, anyway, and anywhere. There's always an inherent possibility of danger. So it's important for us then in working with students to help them understand that these safety programs that we put on in the school, starting with elementary, middle, and high school, are extremely important for their welfare. Because if we train our students to be alert for those unsafe conditions, to be alert for potential problems within the school, to be alert and to take their issues of safety to parents and to adults, then we can better solve those, solve those problems over the long run. I always have some regret when we talk about crisis plans in public schools. Because crisis means imminent danger. And so I would hope that we never have to use a crisis plan. But I do think it's extremely important for us to follow our jobs and our respective responsibilities because the safety of our students in this school district remains the very top priority. Because if we do not have safe schools, if our children do not feel safe here, and parents do not feel that their children are in places of harbor of safety, then we will never be able to accomplish our educational goals. You know, schools are safe places here in Henderson County. We have a fantastic relationship in working with first responders, our police, our sheriff, our hospitals, our emergency uh, active groups. We've all worked together, we've planned together, we've interfaced our action plans. We know what's expected. We know how to follow the protocol to get the job done in the face of emergency. Hopefully we'll never have that crisis. By planning, by being careful to avoid those areas that could pre present danger to our children, we're able to accomplish anything that comes along in the way of an issue that involves our safety of our children. They are our most priceless possession. Each of you have the responsibility to maintain that safe environment in the classroom, in the halls, in the playgrounds, wherever activities are covered by the students, wherever we involve in school and out of school. Safety is our priority. We hope that you'll work with us in making that so. Thank you.
It may feel like just another day at the office. But occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes, bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. If you were ever to find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you are out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight, act with aggression, improvise weapons, disarm him, and commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter.
your actions can make a difference for your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. I'm Steve Steiner. Thank you for watching today. HCTV, signing off.